So let's look at our learning objectives, what we will be learning and actually what we learned uh, last time. So last time we were listing advantages of little apps and workflows. We were showing how we can use the X compiler to uh, compile and then how to run workflows. We were defining data types and basic little syntax. We were writing tasks and workflow using a little uh, libraries. So we were showing how you can write task and workflow. And today we will be looking more about the standard library. We're refining workflows with metadata and we will uh, dive a little bit deeper into that today. Compute dynamic resource requirements. We will do that today. Integrate the use of containers into workflows and create Docker images from scratch. And uh, there will be a poll question in the end of uh, this session. So we encourage you to stay. So you can uh, answer, us, answer on our question and by that customize what webinar will, will, will you hear from us. So just to review previous session is that uh, we were uh, saying that the little workflow description language, how it's used in the Indian Access platform or in UKB wrap is it is translated into native Indian Access workflows and apps on the platform, and then it's run as a uh, native workflow. That we have a DX compiler, which is Java utility that translates Whittle into the Indian Access native workflows. And the one workflow is compiled, it's loaded onto your project, and you can run it like any workflow on RAP. And we were also talking about Whittle syntax. We're talking about workflow syntax, if you maybe remember this diagram when we were comparing the Indian Access native workflows and the Whittle workflows, we were talking about task syntax, but it has inputs, outputs. There are also a command section there, and then there's a runtime. And we're talking about scattering together and conditionals. So I also encourage you to make a feedback after this webinar, because in the previous webinar feedback, we, there was a, um, uh, a suggestion to in, to show more how you can have inputs uh, in the UKB wrap specifically. And that's why we added those slides here. And there were also suggestions about uh, how that we show more real life examples. So we tried our best and we tried to input as much real time, uh, real life examples as we can. So what we'll be doing today, as it's written here going further, so we'll be looking at some advanced topics. So we will be specifying a wrap inputs in command line interface. We'll be calling native VNN access apps. We'll be using sub workflows in order to um, uh, like divide our workflow into steps where it's too large. Uh, we'll be talking about expression and expression placeholders. And we'll be using some of the functions in standard library. We were using some of the functions before, but now we'll be defining it more and categorizing them. We'll also look at the Weedle development best practices and effective project management. And the best thing in the end uh, that we'll talk to you about the Docker, how you can create Docker images and how you can use Docker images in a uh, Weedle task. So we start with, uh, uh, so today we'll, all of the Weedle topics that we'll have will be advanced topic because we're on our second sessions. So we'll start with specifying inputs for a workflow run. So here is a nice mapping between user interface on my left <laughs> and, um, and how it's look like in the command line. So here you see that there is a, um, um, we were using uh, filling files. So there's bad beam and fun. And here how it's translate when we would run this in a, uh, in a command line. So we use VX run utility from the X toolkit. There is our workflow ID. Workflow ID is something what you will have once you will make a, a DX compiler. Uh, we're talking here about our Riddle workflow and for Riddle, you need to compile them. And by compiling, you will get your workflow ID. So you have your workflow ID and you also have a different stages here. And here you're specifying uh, the file pass. So the file name was a file pass. Here's just um, another example of that. So in case you don't want to do it like this, like you don't want to make it as a command line arguments, but you want to have it as a JSON file. In the first uh, session, we were uh, showing you how you can first generate Whittle 
format JSON input and how you can use the X compiler to transform this Widdle JSON to DNA Nexus JSON. So let's assume that you have it. And here's how you can fill this in. So this is uh, the Widdle workflow that we were using in our first session when we were um, looking into CRAM files, we were transforming CRAM to BAM. We were then slicing uh, our BAM and counting number of alignments. So for that, we needed to have number of chromosomes. We need to have our CRAM file and CRAM index. And because CRAM is a compression, which is what was made to a reference file, we're also using uh, for this computation, reference FASTA and reference FASTA index. Um, so sorry, there should be um, a FASTA index. I will, I will change it um, afterwards. So, so here is how your input JSON would look like or how our, our input JSON would look like. So uh, uh, this is uh, by AID because we could not share it, but the, the structure remains the same. The thing is that I need to, so these were the files that we loaded ourselves. And in your case, in your project, this could be a bit different based on what uh, whole exome sequencing data release you have. So there could be different file names. But this is generally what you fill in if you want uh, when you are running your little workflow. Okay, so these were about uh, inputs. Then um, we were talking about meta and parameter meta before, like generally for Widdle specification. Now we will be talking about how you can use meta and parameter meta for um, leverage its power in using it specifically in UKD rep. So um, maybe if you remember the just recapitulation that meta provides oral metadata about the task. So we were showing that you can have, uh, for example, last date of revision, who made it, uh, email, and so on. Parameter meta provides a metadata for input parameters. For example, you would like to say some health messages. What is the parameter A means, for example? And this is what you have uh, to put into parameter meta. So we, on UKB wrap, we will using meta parameter to indicate that the task calling native applet, native DNA nexus applet. And we will be using parameter method to identify that we do not need to download file, we just need to stream it. So let's look at the, some examples. Uh, so here is an example of parameter method in its Widdle specification, let's say. So we have a, we have a file here uh, as an input and the name of the name of our input matches key in parameter meta section. So here's the in file and here's count the number of lines in this file. Um, so here, here, is, uh, here is another example that we have. So the in file, in, in file that we could have a, a DX, uh, DX type to um, end and stream here. So the, the stream parameter that I was talking about. We also can specify the patterns here. So um, as I was saying about streaming, sometimes you don't need to download the file completely, but you, don't, you want just to read it and then use it. And for that, uh, we can have a, a stream here parameter. So you specify stream as a key and a value stream. And also um, you, can, um, you can have localization optional, which is a parameter that allows you to identify um, the files which do not need to be downloaded locally for us to succeed. And by that, it will um, uh, save your money and time. Um, so the next topic that we'll be talking, and also as I said, advanced topic is how you can reuse uh, native apps and how you can modularize workflow. So we'll be talking about if you want to use the app which is already available on the Nexus and Hint, you want to use app which is already available. Do not reinvent the wheel. Start with using app which is already available and only when you are unsatisfied with it for whatever reason, you can customize, like build it from scratch. So um, when we want to call existing applets, uh, we can use um, 
the prom, uh, subcommand of the X compiler, which is the X and I, which is the X native interface. And basically what this subcommand does is that it will generate a little uh, file, which will contain wrapper as a like task wrapper for each of the native um, apps that you have in the specified directory. And then you can use this file to import the tasks into your main workflow from it. So let's show it right here. So we'll start with uh, actually making our widow file. So here we have our DX compiler, which we already were using. It's in Java, that's why we're using Java uh, char here. We, we need to use our DX and I uh, subcommand in order to create these task wrappers. We're specifying project and we're specifying output. Uh, we're specifying, sorry, we're specifying folder where our applets are, and we're specifying output like name of the little file that will be generated. And so what it's doing, if we, for example, have our applet, which is called contact, and it's having two input parameters, two strings, like A and B, and output is a result, which is also a string, and this is a specification. In case you don't know what DX app.json means, uh, I encourage you to go and to look uh, on the community site. You will see um, materials for apps and workflows webinars when we are going into how we can actually generate DX app JSON and customize it for the app. So we have this DX app JSON. This is not something that DX and I is doing. This is something that is made when you are building your applet. From that, in our dx um, external, dx underscore extern dot uh, you will have the task wrapper. So from, uh, so it's taking information from the JSON file and it will make a task, which is the name is contact, as the name of the applet. So you see that the uh, data type and the name of the input match, and here is a result also matching. But what is important here is the meta section. So as I said, that meta is important. And meta is important because we're specifying that it's a native applet and here is the applet ID. And then once we have this uh, uh, task wrapper, we can use it in our main workflow. So what we're doing is we're importing it as we're doing here, and then we're calling it because we imported this as lib. So we're calling lib dot concat as concat, and then we're using uh, the input parameters. So this is how you would uh, use, how, what, what you should do if you would like to uh, use an existing applet. An alternative is, if for whatever reason you want to make a task wrapper from scratch, is that uh, you need to, um, again, at meta, part with the type native and ID of the um, uh, of your app. And you need to have a command part and key. And then you need to fill in uh, in appropriate format inputs and outputs. So uh, this is the way how you were working with the native app apps. And here we were using um, our task wrapper to import in the main uh, workflow. But what if you not only have like different tags that you can import, but you also want to um, divide your workflow into sub workflows, how you can do that? We will cover it right now. Is that, uh, so maybe you remember from the first session, but I want to emphasize that one will file can contains only one workflow. So there could be like, multiple numbers of tasks, but only one workflow. And uh, there's actually no any rule when you would like, when you need to use sub workflows. It's more, if you want to make your code more readable. So if you're finding that your will, you know, it's several hundred lines and you're starting like to lose your track where, where is what, maybe it's good to modularize your code and to say, for example, um, like to divide it on some, like based on what analysis is done and make it as a sub workflow. Uh, so here, for example, 
what is a common way to, to make workflows is one workflow for variant calling and another workflow for post-processing, making some annotations. And here is an example, because some of you said that we want to have really real life examples. So this is what I found. And you will see that you can go to the, um, uh, you can uh, go to this uh, link and see the whole workflow. It's that, uh, so there is a variant calling workflow and you have a QC part. So here is a sub workflow, which is doing QC. So for example, first is a fast QC. And uh, the QC workflow is a first part in the main workflow here. Here is important, imported as a QC sub workflow. And here it's used like that with specified inputs. So this is an example of how you can use the sub workflows. But again, it's more like uh, the idea here is to make your code easier readable. So, um, so I know by looking into this file that this is a QC part. And if I want to look more like what exact QC procedures are done, I'm going to use sub workflow. So this makes the two uh, files much like smaller and easier readable. So um, when I'm using some, so we were talking about tasks that we can use. And in task, we can use a, a command part, which is a bash or Python part. And we can also use standard libraries. So this is our, these are some built-in functions for Whittle that there are. And we did not make the whole list of these functions, but we tried to make, uh, to show you some of the functions that we're using for things. So here are the example functions that you can see. So this is a list of built-in functions, and then there is a link to specific functions that we're seeing here. So there is a function that can read files, so either read JSON, TSD, or lines, and also function to write files, so write JSON or write CSV. There are also some, uh, so I'll, I'll make a listing here, and then I will show a few, a few examples. There are also some functions for string manipulation, for example, replace substring or base name. We're using base name. So you can either use a bash base name or um, a little base name. So here's an example of um, read lines from JTK basic variant validation rule. So um, here you see there's a read, read lines of the interval list. And here, just an example, what is the interval list is that is used as an input? Okay, so there's a list of chromosomes here. Here's an example of base name. So uh, here's our example tar files is a list of strings, uh, which is, for example, called variants.tar.gz. And by doing base name, um, you are actually will get this part called underscore variance, and you can use it to customize your output uh, names for the workflow. Also, there are um, uh, functions on array manipulation. So we were using select first a lot in our first part when we were defining default values. For example, we have a list uh, of values, either uh, variable age or 42, and in case variable age is not provided because it was optional, the 42 uh, value was used. Also, there is a flatten, a flatten array, transpose, lens, select all, or define. And also, there is a floor manipulation. I would actually like to say that we'll be using a sale function for um, like uh, rounding up uh, for our dyna dynamic resource allocation. So for example, this is actually an example of that. So here you see that there is a disk size. And for disk size, we're using sailing function where we are looking at the input band size and the input reference size. And based on that, we're defining disk size. But Ted will cover it in more details afterwards. So we were talking about uh, a standard library functions. And now I would like to show more how you can look into expressions. So 
the wearables that were defined in Widdle code, how they can be used in, um, in the command uh, task section, uh, section. So here are Widdle expressions. Um, and again, like this is not a complete list of that. So uh, you can use uh, the operators which are like common in many different languages, Boolean operations, file, uh, float and strings, but you can see complete list here. And um, what you can do is that uh, you can use conditional uh, expressions to customize your tasks. I just want to emphasize that it's not suitable for restarting failed jobs. So it's really for customization that tasks are already running. So for example, here you are specifying um, array lens, and then with runtime sessions, you are uh, setting memory that if array lens is more than 100, then use 16 gigabytes or else use eight gigabytes. So this is used for <clears throat> expressions here used, sorry, for customization of your memory. And so this is a dynamic resource allocation. Or here, you're using it for custom uh, string creation. So here you have Boolean morning, and here you see that good is morning, but if morning is false, then you will use afternoon. And again, this is the list of documentation. So uh, we try to put as much links as possible. So you can use our presentation, our slides as a reference material, but with a lot of links to specification. And we know that Widdle specification is huge. So we try to put it to exact specific parts so you don't have to go through the whole specification. We actually done it for you. So we were talking about expressions and now let's look at the expression placeholders. So um, they're referred to a previously defined Widdle variable and they're in command session, section. Sorry. Uh, and the different placeholder style is based on different command style. So if you would be using curly brackets with the tilde, you can use it with both command body style. Uh, the dollar annotation only with this curly brackets and the tilde annotation is preferred because by that you can distinguish what is bash wearable and what is widdle wearable. And again, the goal here is to make your code readable more readable. So we definitely recommend you to use the tilde notation. So let us look at the expression placeholder as we see here. So uh, this is again from JTK basic variant validation. And these are the different, <coughs> different variables that were defined previously in the input section or after the input. So this is how they're you saw the tilde notation and the curly bracket. Um, what if you want to set true and false value? This is also what you can do in expression placeholder. So for example, here is a variable that were defined in input, split by barcodes. And looking into the code, I can see that it's a Boolean, um, Boolean variable. So in case the blue, in case split by barcodes is true, to your ban to fast uh, um, command, you will get dash dash split dash barcodes. In case it's false, you will not get anything. And this is the way how you can customize your um, how you can customize your code. Here's an, another example of expression placeholder: is that um, this uh, is not a boolean. Um, wearable and this will be sick ID prefix. So this you're customizing like what you will put here. So instead of, um, so, so this is how you can propagate the ID prefix from the inputs. So you have dash dash sick ID dash prefix and the space here, and then you're adding your string, which will be then concatenated from the command program. Um, also, what you can do is you can uh, have a, a multiple values with separator. Sorry. So here we have our array of files. If you remember, plus means that it should not be empty. And for our case, it's sufficient because we have a, a 
three bands here. So we have an array of uh, files here. And how will we be using that? So we're using mutex2 here, and we have um, dash i, and here there's expression placeholder that we have our array of files, which are separated by space dash i. And what will it get it? In our case, you will have dash i first bump, dash i second bump, and dash i so third bump. So this is how you can customize your, or how you can propagate your values in case you have, you need to unpack array of values. And so uh, now that we'll talk about uh, dynamic resource allocation is that how you can actually customize your um, resources based on what input bias you have. Let's take a quick breath. That's a lot of information in this session. Um, but so now we've kind of talked about, you know, these expressions and expression placeholders. We're going to basically use them to do something really useful on the platform. We're going to use them to dynamically allocate an instance based on uh, the size of a file. So this is just kind of an example that I'm going to take you through. Um, and um, again, this, the slides will be available for you to review. So um, one thing might be, uh, you, you saw that basically in the runtime, you can request a certain amount of memory. Um, what you can do is actually compute, compute uh, the size in terms of gigabytes uh, of the file and basically use that as an input to memory. So um, essentially what you have here is that you have this kind of calculation here that basically um, you've got this input file, uh, bed file here. And basically you're going to look at the size of that input bed file. Um, and that way, basically it's going to get, it's going to request um, the right amount of memory based on that. Um, one thing to keep in mind is it's always good to actually have more memory than you think think it is. Um, so in this case, we're adding 512 megs to that. Um, so our, our basically our um, request is basically going to be made in um, in 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 megabytes here. So there are kind of a couple of functions that are very useful um, when you're doing these kinds of calculations. The first is size. So the size command basically lets you compute the size of the um, of the, your input. And he, in this case, um, we want we're saying that we want the input value in megabytes. Um, and then we'll use the ceiling function or seal C C E I L here. And we'll use that to basically kind of round things off. So we're not kind of inputting like a, inputting like, you know, a decimal place here. Um, in this case, um, you can, this is kind of a request um, in terms of like, you know, calculating the amount of time. And so kind of based on, based on the amount, the, this basic, using a similar kind of expression, we can basically calculate, um, the, the time required based on um, based on the size of the file. So you can see that we're assigning this time minutes um, time minutes uh, variable and then we'll use it kind of in runtime. So this is it's actually kind of a very um, rich topic. Um, if there are more questions about this, we'll try to have more examples about this, but this is, Again, this is kind of one way that you can kind of reduce the sizes of your instance by kind of reducing like, you know, the memory or disk requirement based on file sizes. Okay, so we just kind of pulled things together with expressions. So let's talk about some tips and tricks for best practices, um, you know, sometimes when you're kind of developing a workflow, it can kind of get away from you and become really hard to maintain. So let's talk about some best practices for kind of maintainability. Um, a lot of these are very similar to um, what you would expect in doing programming in other languages. Um, in general, we really encourage you not to reinvent the wheel. 
Um, there is a, there's actually a tasks repository within the Whittle, um, the Whittle organization, and we'll paste a link to that, or we'll send a link out to, to that. And a lot, a lot of those tasks are already kind of uh, tested and they're very bulletproof. Um, one thing to do think about is to really kind of keep it simple in terms of conditional workflow. Um, you know, a lot of the times we might try to do like nested conditionals. That is very hard to debug. Um, so you will probably want to use something like a critical path kind of um, kind of conditionals. Basically, you kind of um, what it's hard to explain critical path, but um, basically you're you're kind of testing kind of at each stage and basically kind of based uh, for each of those kinds of conditions and based on kind of those um, conditions, you kind of divert it to kind of different, um, different sub workflows, for example. Um, again, you know, you want to use dry um, as, a, as a best practice, don't repeat yourself. Um, so in this case, um, I think really modul modularizing your code, especially if you're going to use it a lot, is going to be very helpful using sub workflows. And we'll be showing like an example of project organization in just a second. Um, you know, I am guilty of not always having clear naming conventions, but, you know, kind of thinking about uh, it, you know, either having like the, the type of the the, the variable type in the variable name, which can always help you, or, you know, making sure that, you know, the, the naming is consistent across the, across your code. And I can't emphasize this more enough is like including documentation. Um, I always say that documentation is not just for other users is for future you. I often forget what, um, what I did. And so like, you know, this is my way of catching my, my future self up and kind of reviewing like what's needed. Um, one other kind of thing that's kind of related is making parameters optional, but you can al uh, also consider setting defaults. So we saw that you could set parameters with uh, optional with that question mark. Um, but, and you can also set, um, set a default value using the equal sign. Um, we'll talk about maintaining good project structures to help with good practices. Um, one other thing is like, you know, we talked about structs last time. And so this, you can think of structs as basically these kinds of, I think, think of them, they're similar to objects. They basically encapsulate a lot of inputs. And the great thing about structs is that you, they're reusable. So for example, if you are analyzing the same file in multiple tasks um, and you don't want to kind of repeat that, you can basically pass the struct into the task um, instead of like, you know, basically talking about all of the inputs. Um, and also there are a lot of other ideas um, here um, in the JAWS documentation. Um, so encourage you to look look at that. So when we have um, in, in the terms of like really keeping it simple and we want to try to reduce logic um, within our command block for tasks. Um, really, you know, when you're ta part of this is really thinking about like, you know, the granularity of your task and keeping kind of the scope of it very small. Um, this is really good for not only um, it makes it easier to test and rerun and reuse, but it's also easier to kind of allocate the uh, co correct resources for that task. So again, like, you know, doing some, you can have simple stuff in the command block, but, you know, kind of, uh, you know, reduce uh, like, you know, conditionals if possible in the command block by making it, making the task granular. So I talked about project management. So I want, we want to kind of provide you with an example. So to kind of help you with reuse of tasks. Um, this, this, is, this sounds a little bit like finger wagging, but like, you know, take what you need out of this. I'm not telling you to do this, but these are helpful kind of hints. So really a good project structure um, basically will reinforce, reinforce good practices and habits. 
Um, we'll see kind of an example in a second. Of course, there is, you know, when you're with one of the big challenges of bioinformatics is that you're always kind of against up against time. Um, and then, you know, so do you spend time kind of developing this kind of project structure and modularity, or is it just really a one off task and it doesn't going, it's not going to need it. So really what it comes down to is the best project structure is the one that works best for your team. So we'll show like kind of a, an organizational example in the next slide. So this is um, what we call a relatively simple structure. So I'm going to, and you can see that we, this is kind of the structure of our, um, within, our within our project. We've got, um, uh, we'll focus on um, these two folders in our simple structure. So we have a folder for workflows and a folder for tasks. And let's dive into the workflows folder first. Um, again, having good documentation, documenting what each workflow does at the top level, but also, you know, keeping your, keeping your workflows separate is really um, a really useful kind of tip, um, especially when your workflows, you may have kind of different variations of a workflow. And so it's good to kind of segregate not only the, the Whittle files, but also the input example files as well. Um, one thing you might want to consider when you've got reusable tasks across workflows is actually to organize them into their own Whittle file or set of Whittle files. Um, this basically helps, you know, in terms of modularity um, because, and helps you kind of stop re uh, repeating yourself. So that's, this is just kind of a basic idea for project structure. Um, so again, I think this is really, you know, in terms of kind of organization, like thinking about using sub workflows when, when where it's necessary, um, using structs to basically kind of pass um, a bunch of inputs into a task, and then using the base name, like Anastasia showed an example of using base name. Um, so always using that kind of as a basis for your file, file naming. Um, and finally, always use kind of small files for test cases when you're developing. You don't want to pay a lot of money uh, for when you're doing your tests. You want them to basically kind of execute as quickly as possible so you can diagnose what's going on. Okay, so one thing, there's kind of not a good place to put this, but this we really want to talk about, you know, what happens when you are basically running a workflow and outputs are generated. So a workflow basic, what happens with a workflow is that by default, um, all of the outputs, um, including intermediate outputs are stored in one folder on the platform uh, within your project. Um, but you can basically take like those intermediate uh, files that were generated for intermediate stages, um, they will be uh, placed into a separate uh, intermediate workflow using the, the reorg flag. Um, you can also, there is also a separate outputs flag that basically will put each output in its um, own separate folder. So um, the reason why we're mentioning this is when you are testing and debugging, um, you know, it's really helpful to be able to kind of examine the intermediate files to debug the workflow. And this way it basically keeps things organized um, for you to do that. So here's the documentation about that. So we talked a little bit about, you know, kind of doing dynamic research requirements. We talked a little bit about, um, you know, some project management and best practices. So let's get into like the final part of today's talk, which is Docker and how it works with Whittle workflows on the platform. So um, I think most of you are familiar with Docker. Um, so part of the reason that Docker exists is that we need a way to package software and their dependencies together. Um, the main reason why we need to use this in cloud computing is it lets us execute that software on a remote worker reproducibly. 
Of course, uh, if you're an engineer, um, your view of Docker is a little different, but I'm just talking from a bioinformaticist perspective. So Docker does solve this problem of installing bioinformatics software from scratch. Definitely, um, when you can, look for the Docker image um, as a way to kind of uh, basically utilize that software. Um, there is the option to build on top of Docker, Docker images to add more software. Um, that's a little more advanced. That uh, involves like building Docker files. Um, we won't cover it here, but if there's interest, we're going to have a poll in a little bit. Um, we, we can cover more information about Docker. Finally, I just want to mention that this is really the preferred way to manage dependencies on the platform. I mean, you can basically you can basically do an APT install and everything like that, but this is a good way to kind of make make sure that everything is kind of reproducible. So just being specific about you know the definitions of Docker. So it is what's called a container format. And it encapsulates, most importantly, your software executables and all of the dependencies they need to run. So, for example, if your uh, dependent, uh, if your software needs to use uh, wget, for example, it's going to include that um, particular dependency installed. And the main reasons we use it are because it's portable, um, so we can use it across multiple platforms and systems. It's reusable and reproducible, and also that it's shareable. So I'm going to be using a few kind of terms just so we kind of get everything kind of clear. Um, so I'm going to use Docker image to refer to a static snapshot of an environment uh, versus a container, which is actually um, that kind of that kind of environment actually running on a, on a system. So that's kind of a dynamic in-memory instance of an image. And then finally, the Docker registry is that kind of remote source of those Docker images. Um, speaking of, so just wanna point you to some of the public registries um, that are very useful. Um, Key.io or Quay.io, never sure how to pronounce that. Um, this is a, a Docker registry, which can be private. Um, BioWiddle, so this is a bunch of, this is a Widdle registry using Docker. And then BioContainers contains a lot of bioinformatics specific Docker containers. So let's talk explicitly about the ways that you can use Docker within your Widdle file. So we showed a little bit about this in the previous session but I want to basically kind of uh, take you through the options and talk about what our recommendation is. So again, you can, um, you can just pass in the URL for that particular, um, that particular Docker image. So here's an example. So you can um, pass in key.io slash biocontainers slash SAM tools. One disadvantage to to using this is that the registries do have pull limits. So if you are doing batch analyses in which you are spawning um, a, a separate job for each file, you're going to run it up against this pull limit. And I, um, we, we think it's about 100, 100 pulls. So there, there is this kind of disadvantage to kind of just putting in the URL. But you know, if this is just kind of a one-off task and you're only using it for a small subset of files, this may be appropriate. You can also utilize uh, the private registries like uh, key.io, and there's a link to talk about how, you, how do you specify reg, uh, credentials, where do you store those, and um, safely store them, again, because you don't want to put your credentials within your Widdle file or share those. Um, but this is the recommended alternative that we're going to be talking about today. So you can actually use a, do a Docker snapshot file um, or a Docker um, image file that is saved on the platform. And we'll talk about this like little syntax in a second. Uh, one thing to know is when you basically have specified a Docker image, the Whittle task is run inside the container. Um, so like when you're actually running um, tasks within the container, you don't actually need to specify Docker run. Mm -hmm. So one example is if you use the GATK um, container, 
um, you would basically just use a GATK command rather than Docker run GATK. So I talked a little bit about getting like these images as snapshot files onto the platform. So you can either do this on your own machine or you can do it within the TT, TTYD app on the platform, which I'll talk about in just a second. So the first step is basically doing a Docker pull of that image. And so you can see we're pulling in GATK with this particular version. Once that um, image is on, onto your machine, you can use Docker save to basically save that as a snapshot file. So here we're going to use Docker save and there, our output is going to be called GATK underscore image dot tar dot GZ. And then we need to basically specify what that image is that we want to save. So once you have gotten this, so this basically um, makes that Docker image into a, uh, into a file. And then you can upload that snapshot using DX upload um, into, the, into your project. So this is an example here where we're just basically uploading that image into our project and to a, into a folder here called Docker images. And you can see that within that Docker images folder, we've got our file. So how do you actually, like with the snapshot, how do you specify that particular file? So in the runtime, um, in the runtime key, you're going to use DX followed by the snapshot file path instead of the Docker URL. So here you can see that we're using that um, file that we have in our project called doc, um, docker underscore images slash GATK underscore image dot tar dot GZ. So this again, this is useful because it avoids reaching the pull limit of Docker registries. Um, also like, you know, you. It, it can save you some some pain uh, about the you know specifying credentials for private registries, um, and one idea. So this this is um, one thing to point out. This does break portability, but one thought to kind of uh, maintain portability is you can use conditionals to switch between URL and Docker image based on based on you know the. Uh, uh, to, so you could basically um, switch between this Docker, um, this image file, uh, this image file, and the URL um, using conditionals here. Um, I mentioned TTYD, so I just want to kind of explicitly tell you what TTYD is. So this is a terminal in the web browser um, that's opened in the remote worker. So this is an app that runs on wrap. I shouldn't. Uh, I'm, okay, and um, basically you'll see that you, you'll you basically get a terminal here. And so like doing your Docker, you can do your Docker pull. So I have an example here like of uh, pulling it from key.io of GATK. And you can do that whole process of Docker pull, Docker save and Docker upload um, directly into your project. Uh, oh, and one thing to note is that TTYD is associated with your particular project. So it does simplify a lot of things. Um, you can also do a lot of testing within TTYD, which it can be really helpful when you're kind of debugging things at the command line. Um, so you can either use the usual DX download or you can use DX fuse, which we talked about um, to access the files in the project for testing. You know, Whittle is a kind of its own thing and it's, Take, it's a learning process. We can show you a lot of it, but a lot of it is like you're going to have to get your hands dirty. So we want to basically provide as much help as we can. So definitely always check the uh, UKB RAP community to ask um, DNA Nexus and other users. Um, and then definitely these links. So the Open Whittle, the Open Whittle uh, repository um, page. And this is our main, like if you have like questions about particulars, uh, this is kind of the first place to look. This, this exer, expert options um, link within the DX compiler repo. And it talks about a lot of things like streaming in more detail. Um, and if there are feature requests, uh, consider submitting a ticket um, on the DX compiler GitHub page. And this is a link to the GATK forums and work.
So we basically, okay. So any, uh, let's just kind of stop things right now and uh, let's kind of look at questions. Yeah, so we have one question about how you can uh, download large number of small files. Uh, yeah, and I see that Andre is uh, answering to that uh, currently. And also uh, there is a, um, an, a question from Ben. And I'm not sure about what technology is Ben talking. Maybe if you're uh, familiar with that, Pat, if you can comment on that. Um, yeah, just a second, let me take a look. So I am interested in running CROO to organize Whittle's output. Will DNA next? So, is, so um, I uh, have to- If I'm correct, then it's Cromwell Output Organizer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so you can, um, there, you can provide a different kind of organizer in the final kind of intermediate when you're using reorg. Um, and the documentation is actually in that expert options. So there's um, information on that. Um, so take a look at that and like follow up with us if you have any more questions. Um, so hopefully that will at least steer you in the right direction. 